Have you ever dreamed of playing in a rock band? <laughs> a couple. I grew up playing the violin and dreaming of playing classical music. But all of that changed one night in 1964 when on a Sunday night I tuned into the Ed Sullivan Show, as is our one, and saw the Beatles. And from that moment on, I wanted to play lead guitar in a rock band. <laughs> now, several years later, myself, my roommate, who was actually a great roommate, <laughs> who was a drummer, and two other guitar players, and myself formed a band. Now, one of the things that you have to negotiate in a band that has three guitar players is who has to play the bass. And the rule is, the worst guitar player has to be the bass player. <laughs> so it's kind of a booby prize. And the reason for this has to do basically with women. Because all the girls go for the lead guitar player or the vocalist. Nobody goes for the bass player. It's the Rodney Dangerfield of the band. It gets no respect whatsoever. So guess who was the worst guitar player? <laughs> Yours truly. So, in a way, it was a booby prize. But today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of this instrument, which is, I found to be very interesting. I'll tell you a little bit about why it doesn't deserve to be the Rodney Dangerfield. And I will hopefully demonstrate that with some things that at least maybe Carl will <laughs> know about, and some of you younger people can ask your grandparents about it. <coughs> so this is all about that bass. Well, some about the bass. Maybe not all. The modern bass guitar came about as bands got louder, and this predates rock and roll, so that the upright basses that they were playing couldn't keep up with big horn sections or, or guitars and other things going on. So there was a push to electrify it. Now, the very fir first bass guitar was actually created by the Rickenbacker Company in 1930s, but it never really took off. And there were a number of other false starts, but the very first commercially available bass guitar was made by Leo Fender, and it was called the Precision Bass. It was called the Precision Bass because, like a guitar, it had frets. And so unlike a double bass, which doesn't have frets, where your intonation is imprecise with the frets, you're, it was very precise. So th this is what it looked like in 1951, and this is actually from a later patent drawing. It evolved over time. So that in the 1950s, it looked a little bit different. It looked something like this. And here's an ad uh, for that time. This turned out to be tremendously popular. So for the first time, the bass instrument in a group could actually compete with all those other louder instruments. And this was largely in country music, of all things, and gradually came to be one of the most popular instruments in the burgeoning rock and roll. In fact, Elvis Presley's bass player, who began with the double bass, eventually switched to one of these instruments. Now, it was mostly in rock and roll, but jazz players started getting interested in the idea of using the electric bass for, for their bass, because again, it was the same problem. The guitars were getting louder. Pianos were always very loud. Drums, for, forget it. But the bass? just wasn't keeping up. So what Fender did in the 1960s is they came out with a bass called the jazz bass. And the, it was targeted toward jazz players, but rock players decided to, uh, to use that as well. Now, th there were a number of other companies. I can't go through all of them, but some of the more influential ones was, again, Rickenbacker, who had formed, uh, created the very first one back in the 1930s. In the 1950s, they came out with uh, a series of bases. This one is actually a, a slightly later model, 
And it was very popular, especially in Britain, with so-called classical rock players. In the 1950s, the Hofner Company in Germany uh, came out with the Hofner bass, and this was made popular, and to call back to our friend the Beatles, this was played by Paul McCartney. And so, since the Beatles have been very influential in my coming into rock, I decided to get one for myself. So this is yours truly, with his very first bass, which was, in fact, one of these violin-shaped Hofner basses. But I wasn't entirely happy with it. It didn't have that driving sound. And so I decided to get a 1964 jazz bass, which I bought for fairly cheap. Uh, th this isn't it. Actually, this is it. <laughs> because when I left <coughs> the whole genre, I sold my bass. This is my bass. I sold it to uh, Tony Cimbarossi, uh, who's back east. He's a professional jazz musician who is absolutely incredible, and he plays this far better than I ever could. But recently, I acquired one of these, a Marcus Miller jazz bass. And just to show you that the Rodney Dangerfield <laughs> is not deserved, some of you might recognize things just from the bass line, like things, but that didn't happen. <laughs> the goals of this speech are to get comfortable with visual aids, to advance them and use them with appropriate visual aids, and to use them with confidence. So I expected the PowerPoint, and once I heard him talk about the bass, I knew he would be pulling something out of the corner <laughs> because he's played violin in, in many speeches. And I'll give you some feedback as I go along. As you know, I do the goods and the could be betters, and I intersperse them. When you talked about, at the very beginning, you had the white PowerPoint with the title of the speech. That was a little long, and you talked about a bass. And me not being a musician, um, I thought of the big bass that they have. And then you. After about a minute, you went and you talked more about bass guitars. And you were supposed to well research the subject, which clearly you did. I had one suggestion for a slide of a big bass to compare with the others. And also, you called the bass as the Rodney Dangerfield of basses. And some of these young people may not even know who Rodney Dangerfield is. He was a very kind of sick comedian in the 50s and 60s and 70s. I loved that you slowly and meticulously advanced the slides while keeping great eye contact. Your facial expressions from the beginning to the end were excellent. I had a couple lines over here for suggestions. Yeah, and when you have the slide up with Paul McCartney and you showed him using a slide, you were talking about a 50s guitar that he still uses today 
And that confused me because I don't think the Beatles came in to vision till the 70s. So just a little technicality on that one. At the end, your timing was very close to seven minutes, and I wondered if you had shortened that introduction with just the one white slide, it would move along and progress a little bit better. I loved hearing the samples of the bass at the end, and that was the kind of piece de resistance. But overall, you met the goals of your 13th number eight. <laughs> 13th. And I thank you for that. Thank you.